Greetings, Sunrise Church family and friends. It is good to gather again. Um, even though we are not all together, we are able to be together online, and that's exciting. And so welcome. Um, this morning, uh, Bill's going to continue in his study of John. We don't have really a lot of announcements. I was so rudely interrupted last week in the middle of the announcement period that I thought I would reiterate that Wednesday at 630, you can have coffee with Bill. Uh, Pastor Bill provided you have your own coffee at home. And I was mentioning, you don't have to have coffee. You can have tea, milk and cookies, and an adult beverage, we won't judge, there's no judgment. So, but please, if you're interested at all, we're doing a Zoom meeting with Pastor Bill at 6.30 Wednesday evenings. If you don't uh, have the link, you can email Bill at pastorbill at sunrisechurch.us, Pastor Bill at Sunrise Church US, and he will provide you that link and some instructions. So with that, we are going to once again begin with the first word. Bill, will you come? Good morning, folks. We're glad you're with us this morning. And uh, as we begin this morning, I want to invite us to uh, look at John chapter seven for first word. I'll be preaching from that same chapter, but I'm reading from verses 37 and 38. And on the last day of the feast, the, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our only hope to find rivers of living water, to find the, the quenching for our thirst, the thirst of our souls is found in Jesus Christ. And so this morning, it's in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And as the Lord has greeted us, we invite you to worship with us. And uh, typically we would sing at this point. We're not gonna do that this week. And uh, actually, I see that my uh, video on my screen is blinking at me. So uh, Jana, just Jana, would you text Dwight and tell him if it's coming through and looking good or not? So, so let's uh, go to the word, uh, go, go to the Lord uh, in, in prayer and ask him uh, to meet us in our need and brokenness. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your love and your faithfulness to us. We know, Lord, that uh, we are living in a world where there is conflicting stories. There are invitations to believe this or that or another thing. We know, O oh Lord, that uh, we have been influenced by news reports and we've been influenced by philosophies of this world. We've been influenced by entertainment in the popular culture. And in these things, there is a discrepancy with what is revealed in the truth of your word. And so, Lord, as we come to you this morning, we pray that you would turn our hearts and our minds back to the truth of God's word, back to the words of Jesus, back to the one who quenches the thirst of our soul with his living water. And so, Father, we bring to you the needs that we have. You know, the needs that, that we have, whether it's of uh, Sunrise uh, Church family members, or people listening in around the around the country, around the world. Uh, however, someone found themselves in this place here today. We pray that uh, whatever their cares are, whatever their concerns are, that they would re be reminded that the God who created them, the God who created the heavens and the earth, the sovereign Almighty Lord, is bigger than any problem that we face. And our call is to come to you and to look to you, to allow you to be the lifter of our heads, to look beyond our despair, look beyond the challenges that we face and to trust you with our whole life. And so, Lord, I pray for myself and for my friends that you'd give us a special measure of your Holy Spirit's grace that we can turn over the cares that we have in this life, whether they're physical concerns for our health or our finances, or our family members, our relationships, 
uh, no matter what it may be, Lord, where we find the deficiency in us and in the world around us, may we put our trust in you alone. And in all these things, Lord, we pray that you and you alone will be glorified. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. This is the word of the Lord from the Gospel of John, chapter 7, starting in verse 1. After this, Jesus went in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So his brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world, for not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it, that its works are evil. You go up to the feast, I am not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up not publicly, but in private. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said, he is a good man. Others said, no, he is leading the people away astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it this man has learning, yet he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true and in him there is no falsehood. Has Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, you are a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered them, I did one work and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is for Moses, but from the fathers and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, you are angry with me, with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Thus ends the reading of the word, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Thank you, Elder Mark. Uh, for those of you out there in, uh, around the globe that aren't familiar with Sunrise Church, Mark is one of the elders here at Sunrise Church, as is Dwight uh, also, who uh, gave us the, uh, the welcome and the announcements this morning. So um, that's some of the do I dare say the power structure of Sunrise Church? <laughs> Not. Power, I guess, is a relative term. Uh, let's pray as we come before the Lord, before the word of the Lord this morning. Gracious God, we thank you for this revelation of Jesus, this teaching of Jesus that he has given us in John chapter 7. So, Lord, we ask now that you yourself, and your Holy Spirit, would be our teacher and our guide, that you would... Take the truths of this word and apply it to our lives so that we are transformed, that we become the men and women of God, the boys and girls that you call us to be, that you have redeemed us to become, that our lives would be conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ. 
And Lord, I ask to, to that end, I ask that you give me the, the power of preaching upon by your Holy Spirit. For apart from your spirit, I have nothing to add to your holy word. I pray it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So this morning we continue our sermon series entitled Living the Ethos of the Logos and the Pathos World. And uh, for so many, um, those are words that probably you don't know them and they don't make any sense because they're in Greek. And of course, um, they, they do come into to English. These aren't Greek words that I just picked out of the Bible. These aren't uh, necessarily, while these words appear in the Bible in Greek, in the original New Testament language of Greek, uh, the, the notion of ethos, logos, and pathos is not itself a biblical notion. It's found in Greek rhetoric uh, to years, uh, ancient times, even preceding uh, the New Testament, Greek New Testament. But of course, those words, uh, pathos, logos, ethos, um, the pathos is, is the word that we get, uh, where we get the word passion from, of uh, the emotion. And logos is the, where we get the English word of logic or thought or word. And then ethos uh, is, comes to us uh, in most distant form, uh, of these three words. It doesn't sound anything like it, but it's what we would understand as the English word credibility. And so when I say living the ethos of the logos in a pathos world, it's really an invitation to us as Christians to live out the credibility of the logic of Jesus Christ, the truth of Jesus in an emotional world. And so we've been, uh, we've been on this journey since uh, the beginning of the new year. And yet uh, we, as we've come, all the way through January and February and March and April, now to the end of April, um, you know what? I'm going to say time out. We loaded last week's sermon somehow. I did that. I'm not blaming anybody but me. I don't know what happened. Um, but I do want to say that while Dan is busily uh, pulling up the right sermon, on the screen, um, uh, I, I would say that I'm going to shift away from the ethos of the logos and the pathos world. We're going to continue to to uh, think about those things, but uh, really, what we are going to do is going to shift because uh, of the, the importance of the, the the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus that we celebrated just two weeks ago. Uh, on Resurrection Day, the Passion Week, where Jesus uh, goes to the cross on Good Friday, and then he raises from the dead on that first day of the week, Sunday morning on Resurrection Day. And that shifts our focus. That changes everything for the Christian life. And so we're going to shift away from the ethos, logos, and pathos conversation to seeing Jesus in the rear view mirror. Now that's, uh, I'm going to change sermon titles, sermon series titles in the middle of the sermon. So why would I do that? Well, because the cross changes everything. The resurrection power of Jesus changes everything. But of course, um, now that we've come through the resurrection season, uh, we, we view Jesus differently. And so uh, if you were sitting here in the sanctuary at Sunrise Church, you would, uh, we, have these, uh, we have these screens up on, on the wall, the television monitors, and one of the things that we do is uh, uh, have a sermon, series, sermon title slide, and there might be some kind of an image that invokes something in you. And so if I'm gonna change the title to, from living the ethos of the pathos, in, uh, or logos in the pathos world, and I'm gonna change that to uh, seeing Jesus in the rear view mirror, what kind of image should I choose? Now we need to be careful with this. We can't just choose any old uh, image. We need to be careful for a number of reasons. Number one, you can't just go out to the internet and grab a, a, a slide and put it on and use it for public purposes on PowerPoint. Did you know that? That's stealing, you gotta be careful. They're, they're copyrighted just like uh, if you were gonna, you know, uh, quote an author, you need to recognize who the author is. So there are copyright laws about these things. So we gotta be careful about that. But we also need to be careful because there are multiple meanings. There are mixed messages, if you will, about images that we see. I saw one uh, that um, 
I remind, and it reminded me of something my father used to tell me. Uh, on Saturday mornings, it was our tradition to go cut wood behind the house. My dad uh, thought he was still living in the Great Depression. He was born during the Great Depression, and he never really left the Great Depression. Uh, he, he heated the, our house with wood, uh, even though we had gas furnace. Uh, actually, they, the, the year I went off to college and stopped carrying the wood into the house, that's the year they went to the gas furnace. I think it had something to do about losing the family slave, but whatever. Um, he helper, that's perhaps a better word. Uh, no, I'm going to stick with slave. <laughs> they, they got rid of the black and white television and they went to the gas furnace the year that I became a freshman in college and moved out. Thank you very much. Uh, nevertheless, now that's my therapy for the day is passed, we can, we can move on. So my, I used to go uh, to the woods with my dad on Saturday mornings. He'd wake me up just like every young person wants to wake up on Saturday morning about 6.30, 7 o'clock, eat some pancakes. Uh, then he would go out to the Farm Hall A, which is a very old tractor. Uh, we had to crank it. That's how old it was. Trust me, I'm not that old. By the time I was a child, there was electric start tractors. We would crank up the farm all day. We would go out to the woods and probably only a two or three hours it would take us total round trip. Uh, but it seemed like 10 or 12 hours to me. And we would cut a load of wood. And as I got older, he would have me drive the tractor often. And of course, I'm dragging this wagon uh, loaded with wood behind me. And so I want to make sure that I'm not, you know, bumping into things. So I would look around behind me to see uh, to, that the load was safe. And my father would always yell at me. What do you think he said? Look where you're going, not where you've been. Right? So he said that many, many times. Almost every time I turned my head, he would yell out, look where you're going, not where... You've been now that he only did that not to be mean and cruel, but because a couple of times while looking where I had been, I ran into something where I was going. Right. And so we got to be careful about the vision, the, the images that we use or the metaphors, because we can have mixed messages. If you're looking in the rear view mirror, you, of course, don't want to drive by looking in the rear view mirror. You want to look ahead, not to see what was behind you. Right. In fact, I saw one image that was uh, kind of neat uh, when I did a search on Google Images, and there was the, 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 the windshield, the screen with a rear rear mirror, and, and in the front was this beautiful uh, setting, serene setting of mountains, of planes going up to mountains and blue skies, and in the rear rear mirror, you could see thunderclouds and lightning, right? And that, of course, is a metaphor that you don't want to focus on the trials and the problems of the past. You want to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. You want to move forward in life. You want to look ahead. You want to think about the positive things. So those are good things, right? But, of course, hindsight is always 2020. Always. And once we get to the, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, it changes how we think about the ministry of Jesus. And so my point is not that we should only look backwards. No, not at all. My point is that when we see and hear Jesus' ministry from the perspective of the cross, the tomb, and the resurrection, it offers a picture that is more complete. We don't really, so much of the Gospels is Jesus teaching in this ethereal language. But once we see and experience and know and believe about his death, his atoning death on the cross and his power over the tomb through the resurrection, then it fills in the pictures that we were left wondering about before the passion of the Christ. And so I settled on this image that you can't see out there, but if you were here in the sanctuary, you'd see a rear rear mirror with a rosary and a cross. My point is not that we should pray the rosary. My point is that that cross changes everything. And so we view uh, Jesus, when we view Jesus from the rear rear mirror, when we recognize his, the power of the resurrection, it changes everything that we see in the Gospels. 
And so today we're going to go back to where we left off before uh, the Passion Week, before Good Friday, before uh, the triumphal entry, before uh, the resurrection, before Jesus reveal himself, revealing himself to Doubting Thomas that we looked at last week. Those were all, those were basically uh, John chapter 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. We looked at all eight of those chapters in one week. Literally one third of the book of John is about the last week of Jesus' life. And so now we're going to go back. We're going to go back to the future and pick up where we left off in John chapter 7. And as we come to this text today, we are readjusting our worldview, our viewpoint rather. We're readjusting our perspective of Jesus because of what the power of the resurrection has done and what it's revealed to us. And we are looking at Jesus' ministry from the perspective of his death and his resurrection. But where's the rub? As Mark read this text, perhaps you listened carefully. And one of the things that we try to get in the habit of doing at Sunrise Church is listening for the challenge. What's the problem in the text? Where's the hook? What's the thing that leaves me questioning? What, when I step back from the text and look at it, what is the main question that pops to my mind? What seems unreasonable? What really drives this text? Where? is the rub. What is the problem in this text? It is revealed clearly in the very last verse, verse 24. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. That's what Jesus said. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Well, what does that mean? Doesn't everyone think they are judging by right judgment? You know, this is my famous, uh, famous quote when people say to me, you always think you're right. My answer to that is, well, of course I think I'm right. If I thought I was wrong, I'd think something else. Now in my humility, my awesome humility, I can say, I can look back over my life and I can see times in my life where I wasn't right. I thought I was right. I thought my judgments were based on right judgment, but in retrospect, I can see that they were not. But while I'm making the judgment, of course I think I'm right. And so you, you want to join uh, with, the, with, with some that might be a little, might even sound disrespectful. That's uh, what our, our people in the Dutch tradition would call sputten. It's on the verge of being blasphemous, right? And you want to say, come on, Jesus, help us here a little bit. Telling us to judge by right judgment doesn't seem that helpful. And so the real challenge in this text is to discover upon what to base our judgment. What? On what do we build our judgment so that we can be confident that we're obeying what Jesus has said to judge according to right judgment? Seems like an important task, doesn't it? And so therein lies the challenge of this passage. How do we do that? How do we question ourselves so that we know that when we make judgments, they are in fact, right judgments. What is Jesus revealing in this passage about knowledge, about truth, about motives, about authority, and about on what we base our judgments? That's the question that I put before you before we get into the text. But some might say, wait a second, should we even judge at all? Isn't judgment wrong? I've heard people say that. It is wrong to judge. Now, what's the problem with that statement? If so, isn't judging judgment wrong? You know, that's the problem with relativism. If everything is true, then nothing's true. It's wrong to judge, which is itself a judgment. So the minute you say that, where do we go from there? 
You see, the view of the world says this, don't hate, don't discriminate, don't judge. Those are very popular mantras in today's world. Don't hate, don't discriminate, don't judge. Well, depending on what you mean by that, of course I agree. But when you think just a little bit about it, we run into some challenges. See, the world says don't hate, and yet the Bible says, O oh, you who love the Lord, hate evil. It says that in Psalm, chapter, uh, Psalm 97, verse 10. Those who love the Lord are called to hate evil. So if the world says don't hate, does that mean we shouldn't hate anything? We shouldn't hate injustice? We shouldn't hate it when, when evil people do evil things to innocent children? Right? Well, that's, that's a little deeper. That's peeling back the layer of the onion. So just saying don't hate isn't good enough. Because if you love what is good, by definition, you're going to hate what's evil. The world says, don't discriminate. Well, if you mean don't discriminate about a person because of the color of their skin, I fully agree with that. If you say don't discriminate uh, against someone uh, and uh, uh, make judgments about their intelligence level because of the socioeconomic background they come from, well, I agree with that. There are many brilliant people who have been born into poverty. And yet the Bible says whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Proverbs 13, 20. In other words, the Bible says absolutely discriminate, not against skin color or socioeconomic background, no. Discriminate about what is wise and what is foolish. We all tell our children to be careful, right? I'll, I'll say it, you finish the phrase. Bad company makes bad character. I couldn't hear the people online. I couldn't actually hear the seven people in the sanctuary, right? Bad character builds bad, uh, bad company makes bad character. I don't know it either, apparently. What is that teaching? It's teaching our children to discriminate. Go do wise things, don't do foolish things. Hang around with good people, don't hang around with bad people. Look at the right stuff, don't look at the bad stuff. Absolutely discriminate, but don't discriminate based on race or intelligence or socioeconomic background. Treat people justly, but use wisdom. The world says, don't judge. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Wow, really? Yeah, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writing to the people of Corinth, said, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? So when we hear the phrase, don't judge, we have to think deeply about that. We have to think a little differently about that. We have to think below the surface what's really meant by that, because, of course, we don't want to judge wrongly. There's a famous uh, radio commentator by the name of Dennis Prager who says that clarity is our friend, right? Being clear in our conversations matters. So when the world says, don't hate, of course, what we should hear is, don't hate from ignorance and injustice. Don't discriminate wrongly. Don't judge from your own compromised position. So instead of just saying, don't hate, don't judge, don't discriminate. Perhaps we should say those same things in positive statements. And I would suggest that the Bible absolutely affirms these things. Instead of saying, don't hate, perhaps we should hear Jesus' command to love one another and to love deeply. To, instead of saying, don't discriminate, we should hear the admonition to use wisdom. Instead of hearing don't judge, perhaps 
we should hear the words of the scriptures that point us to letting our judgments rest upon truth, wisdom, and grace. And that's exactly what this passage today gets at. Jesus reveals the clear and the firm foundation for truth, wisdom, knowledge, motive, and authority. So let's look together at John chapter 7. And while you're looking that up, John chapter 7, I'm going to grab some water. John chapter 7, verse 1 says, After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go up in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Verse 1. Now, if you know your biblical geography, you know that uh, the Galilee is in the northern part of Israel. It's around the Sea of Galilee or the Lake Gennesaret, which is another name for the Sea of Galilee. And that whole region surrounding the sea is called Galilee. And then if you follow the Jordan River, which flows south out of the Sea of Galilee into the Dead Sea, about 100 miles south, you head south into the area that is known around Jerusalem as Judea. It's where the tribe of Judah was from. And so that's what we're talking about here. Jesus was teaching in Galilee. Now, verse 2 says, Now the Jews' Feast of Booths was at hand. The Feast of Booths was one of three of the pilgrimage feasts, like Passover and Pentecost. The, 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 the pilgrimage feasts are the ones where you need to go to Jerusalem because you need to go up to the temple. And they would say they would go up to Jerusalem because they're going in elevation, not going north. They were actually headed south if you're in the Galilee. But they would go up to Jerusalem because it's up on the mountaintop. And they would go to the temple. And the Feast of Booths is actually, or the Feast of Tabernacles, is actually commemorating the life of the Jewish people, the Israelites, I should say, in the wilderness and specifically remembering um, the water from the rock and manna from the desert. In fact, uh, you heard the call to worship this morning from John chapter 7, verse 37, where it said, Jesus said, anyone who thirsts come to me and they will never be thirsty. He's referring to here, he says that in the middle of the, uh, 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 on the last and great day, I should say, the, the last and great day of the Feast of Booths, which is a week long. It's the only, it's the longest of the feasts. It's a week long. And on that last and great day, Jesus is teaching there. And he says, if you're thirsty, come to me and you'll never thirst. Streams of living water will flow from you. And those are all pictures that would take the Hebrew mind back to the desert where God provides water from the rock for his people. So that's the feast of the Jew, the feast of the Jews, or the feast, the Jews' feast of the booths, rather. And so his brother said to him, now, when we see this word Adelphoi, brothers in Greek, we ask, what is that talking about? Is it talking about the disciples? Is or is it talking about uh, biological uh, brothers? Or is it talking about people who just are hanging out with you know your companions, right? People that are hanging out with Jesus. And here it's uh, it's it's certainly not his disciples, <clears throat> because down in verse 5 it says, for not even his brothers believed in him. And of course his disciples did believe in him. So it's not his companions, it's not those who are following his teaching, but it is those who, uh, are, uh, who are related to him, that are physically his brothers. These were other children that Mary had. Now, some uh, in certain traditions, the Eastern Church and the Roman Church uh, have probably been taught the doctrine of perpetual virginity that teaches that Mary was always, the Virgin Mary remained a virgin her whole entire life and that she had no other children, even though she was married to Joseph. Um, well, that is a teaching of the church that I acknowledge has been uh, long held. It just simply, there's no evidence biblically for that. Uh, so at the very least, this could these brothers could be considered perhaps his cousins, his relatives. But I would argue that they're actually his physical, biological brothers. 
And they say to him, leave here and go to Judea. You're here, you've been hanging around, teaching in Galilee. You really wanna impact the world, go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. And then they continue, for no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. So if you really want your works, your teachings to spread, if you want to impact a lot, if you want to be an influencer in culture and society, then you need to get out of the sticks here. You need to get down to the, the place where people are really thinking about these things. In Jerusalem, in Judea, near the temple, at the time of the feast, get down there and be the influencer since you know it all. And while there's not necessarily something here that says that uh, they're, they're saying it with negativity, we know from verse five, the end of verse four and verse five, that they are saying it with negativity because they continue, if you do these things, show yourself to the world. If you are indeed this big teacher and have all this knowledge, go down and reveal yourself. And then it says, for not even his brothers believed in him. So there it is. There's the negative. That's the snarky comment, right? We don't really believe in you. So if you're so high and mighty, if you're so learned, if you're so influential, if you're so powerful, why don't you get into the center of culture and mix it up with the people who really know what they're talking about? Come on. And Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always here. And of course, this is an important phrase that we th see throughout the Gospel of John. My time has not yet come. And but when we were looking at John chapter 12, just a few weeks ago during the triumphal entry, what is it that Jesus said? He said, the time is at hand for the Son of Man to be glorified. Right? So by the time we get to chapter 12, it is going to be his time. But here in chapter 7, Jesus is still saying, my time has not yet come. This is, this is the previous fall. This is uh, the time of the, of the, 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 the Feast of Booths is in the fall. It's, it's in the harvest time. It's, it's not only the celebration of the, the time in the wilderness, but it's also celebrating the harvest. So this is at least uh, six or eight, nine months later, or earlier rather, than the time of Jesus' passion, his, his death and his resurrection. My time has not yet come, but your time, your time is always here, he says. And then he continues and says, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify that its works are evil. <clears throat> well, now, Another important phrase throughout the Gospel of John is the word, the world, the cosmos. That's the Greek word, the cosmos. Now, there's multiple meanings to the word cosmos in John. Because that's the famous word we find in John 3.16, for God so loved God. The cosmos, that he gave his only son, that whoever should believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And so if you just look at that, God so loved the world. But when we, when we think of that in that context, we don't think of the cosmos. We don't think of the planetary solar systems and the stars and the sun and the moon. But when we use the word cosmos in English, we're talking about the expanse of the universe, right? The whole cosmos. But Jesus clearly in John 3, 16 isn't talking about that. Although I would argue that the redemptive work of Jesus is so broad, so far ranging that he's redeeming the whole cosmos, right? So I think it actually does point to that. But specifically that when here in verse seven of chapter seven, the, when Jesus says, the world cannot hate you, but the world hates me, of course, Jupiter, Mars, and Venus don't hate Jesus. That's not the point, right? The things that are beyond the Milky Way don't hate Jesus. So what's he talking about? 
He's talking about the systems of the world. He's talking about the world views. He's talking about the political schemes and the power structures. He's talking about the things that give meaning and purpose and set motives and priorities. And he says those things, those power structures, the powerful people, the political, the political uh, power brokers, those one, those people, whether they're political or religious or, or economic, those people, those systems, they hate me, Jesus says, because I testify about that it is, its works are evil, that what they do are evil. Verse eight, he says, you go up to the feast, I'm not going up to this feast. And then they leave, and then he goes up to the feast. Wait, but that's what Mark read. In verse 9, it says, after saying this, he remained in Galilee. But in just a few verses, it's the next verse, it says he goes up, or he goes, yeah, he goes up to uh, Judea. He goes up to the feast. So what's he saying? Is this, is this, aha, this is where the Bible's inconsistent. It's inconsistent. Well, not really, because that word, uh, not going up, the translation is better understood as, I'm not going up yet. I'm not going up now. I'm not going up now to this feast, for my time is not fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. And so up to this point, we see that even Jesus' brothers reject him. Those who are physically the closest, the people who've known him the longest, these are his younger brothers. Jesus is clearly the oldest. If he has biological siblings, well, he was the first one. So all the other brothers of Jesus have rejected him. It's very consistent with that passage that we find where Jesus' mother and brothers go down when he's teaching in the home, uh, at a home of one of the Pharisees, and they go down to get him, and they come in, and they say, uh, Master, your mother and your brother are outside, and they would like you to, to come out. And Jesus says, Who are my mother and my brothers? Those who are here, who do the will of my Father in heaven. So Jesus reorders the social conventions of what family actually is. Who do we belong to? Boy, isn't that, that's a beautiful thing, especially for any of us who have received abuse or neglect or mistreatment from our own families. Don't worry, that wasn't really your family. Oh yeah, sure, you share the lineage of your ancestors. Sure, you have the same DNA in part. Yes, you have some of their blood flowing through your veins, but they are not your family. Jesus says, you wanna know who your family is? It's your mother and your brother and your sisters, who are they? They're the ones who do the will of his Father in heaven. And so even Jesus' brothers reject him. We see that the world hates him. The structures of the world hate him because he steps up and he tells them, he reveals to them that their works are evil, their priorities are off, the foundations for what they believe and what they do are twisted, and they don't want to hear it. Nepotism, favoritism, injustice, greed, lust, all of it flows out of self-centeredness, and Jesus says, that's evil. Too much focus on the self when you place yourself over others, that's evil. Chapter 10 says, or verse uh, 10 rather says, but after his brothers had gone up to the feast, there it is, then he also went up. So he said, I'm not gonna yet go up, but when they had left, he went. Not, prob not publicly, but in private. In other words, Jesus sneaks. He doesn't go. He doesn't even go with his disciples now. And the Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? Because uh, their other experience with Jesus was when he uh, healed the man at the pool. Remember that, right? That goes takes us back to John chapter 5. And of course, Jesus went there and he had this entourage of disciples and he performed a miracle. That's in Jerusalem. And so they are now looking for him at the feast because he kind of got into it with them and they challenged him for, for healing on the Sabbath day, 
right? So they're looking for the rabble riser. They're looking for the troublemaker. They're looking for the one who leads people astray. And they're saying, where is he? In verse 12, it says, and there was much muttering about him. Now, what is muttering? I mean, as I'm going to say, muttering, it's like like this. You know, you've you been around people mutter, they just mutter a lot. Okay. Yeah. Mumbling, muttering. A lot of uh, other translations use the word grumbling. I don't really think grumbling is a good translation. I like this translation better. Here's why, because grumbling is always negative, right? You can't grumble in a positive way. Can you mutter in a positive way? Yeah. Sure. Wow. They don't like what he's saying, but I kind of like what he's saying. That's muttering in a positive way. Or you can mutter in a negative way. I don't know. Doesn't sound that good to me. Uh, I don't think I trust that guy. Verse 12 says, and there was much muttering. There was a lot of muttering about him among the people. And while some said he is a good man, others said, no, he's leading people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. See, Jesus was disruptive. His words made people think, and he made them uneasy. He called them to challenge their foundations of their beliefs. Some might say he comforted the afflicted, and others might say he afflicted the comfortable. That's what he did. He was disruptive. He made people uneasy. Verse 14 says about the middle of the feast, right? It's a seven day feast. Somewhere, day three, day four, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. And the Jews therefore marveled saying, how is this man, how is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So they hear his teaching, even the people who would be critical of it, even the people who are jealous of his actions, even the people who don't really want him there, they still marvel. Right? Well, we were joking uh, about who was going to read the scripture this morning, whether it be Elder Dwight or Elder Mark. And Elder Dwight said, I don't want to trip over the big words like marveled. And I made some comment about 